Well, this morning is an important day. I'm so excited about today. I'm in, I'm in overdrive, and I'm just going to tell you ahead of time, I'm going to talk fast, as if that's something new, right? There's a lot of ground to cover. I'm going to try to talk as slow as I can, but this is an exciting day in the life of Pedal First Baptist. And as we've mentioned already before, in our mind, this is as important as the day in 1999 when this church family made a critical and a very important decision to relocate to 992 Highway 42. We believe this vision plan that God has put before us that is one that will take us at least to the year 2020. We hope we can get it done before then, but maybe it'll take some of these efforts and endeavors to happen. It's a fluid plan. It's one that's not in concrete. It's one that we want to listen to the Spirit of God as we move forward. We set some things in front of us that we can kind of plan towards and be prepared for as a church family. This is a unique plan, and it's a plan I want you to know that did not come from your preacher. There maybe are some churches where the preacher sets the whole vision. Everybody else says, that sounds great, but we've assembled a vision team that has been meeting over the last year and a half that helped to flesh out what this would look like for our church. We spent some time reading some books in the Word of God, praying together, seeking God's face. God, where is it you would have us to go? We want to be on your plan and your vision for what you would have Petal First Baptist Church to be. And those folks, I just want to ask them to stand quickly, and I want to recognize them. They've worked hard. They've given lots of hours. They don't want to be recognized, so please would you stand. That meant really stand. I wasn't really kidding, so stand now would be ready. Thank you, Chris, for leading the way. Thank you very much. That's a good staff member, right? Um, these folks, Chris Robbins, our student minister, Brian Riles, uh, Gary Fordham standing in the back, um, Chris Rhodes, Lynn Walton, Jeremy Shiles, Amy Kelly, Barbara Lofton, stand up, D, Andy Simmons, D. McDermott, and also um, some folks that are, have moved on. Uh, Lynn Duck was on our, our team, as well as Greg Bowman. These folks have spent countless hours outside of our meetings as well, reading and digesting and saying, God, thank you. May be seated. Thank you for what they have done. Can we just say thank you for a job well done this morning? Thank you so much. So if you don't like the vision, talk to them, all right? Don't just talk to me, which I, I know that you will. Um, but I, it's very important that you understand this because, yes, I, it is part of my vision. I, I agree with them. We're together on this. But it's not just based on who I am and that I am the pastor of this church. Yes, I'm called to lead, and I will do that, and I will continually put the vision before us. But it is a church embracing this vision. That is the critical component that I want you to see. And I, I want you to know, too, in this, in this uh, thought process, we talked about last week, what if? You remember those who talked about, what if this happened? What if God did this? What if we open ourselves up and God did this? We want to begin to move from the what ifs to the what nows. We want to begin to say, this is the what if plan. This is how we see us getting to those what if moments. What if every person in our church was connected to a life group? What if every person in our church was understanding their call and the obedient call for them to respond to, to be serving somewhere in the life of Petal First Baptist? What if? We want to begin to show you how that's going to happen in a plan that's broad and large that will again be fleshed out by you as the church family. It's kind of a little bit unique in that regard. And some folks that know me very well know that I'm a control person. I like to kind of have my hands in as much as I can. We're going to put it in your hands. We're going to ask you to help flesh this thing out of becoming reality in the life of our church family. And I want you to know we're not just looking at building a building that's significant and important. It involves those things. It involves us adding space and completing space. It involves us having more parking. You can go look out on this morning and all the cars that are parked in the grass. It involves maybe a playground one day. It involves finishing the second floor. It involves finishing the choir suite, some youth space. It involves all that, but it's far more than that. And I want you to know that we're doing not just making some minor adjustments and tweaks. But we're asking the Lord to do a fresh, radical work in your life and in my life, in the lives of those at Petal uh, First Baptist that goes far beyond what we have ever encountered before. I, I want you to know we're not just hoping to make just some little small dent, just some small little dent like the size of a golf ball in the world. We want to make a significant dent in the losses of Petal, First in Petal Mississippi. We talked about last week, 70% of our city, 70%, that is some 13,000 people will not be in church today. Many of those do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we have a call, Petal First Baptist, to not just say, well, we're going to just kind of just kind of try at it, we feel called and compelled to make a dent in the losses of Petal, Mississippi. I hope you feel that. We, we want to make a dent in the losses in the state of Mississippi, which is 70% loss. We want to make a dent in the losses of North America. Maybe it's more than 70%. We want to make a dent in the lostness of our world. We want God to use us from right here in Petal to impact here and to the ends of the earth. 
We're asking the Lord to do in our hearts that will require much more than we've ever given before. And be reminded, because we talked about all that God has done. I just was sitting here thinking this morning, looking across this congregation. I was flashing back in my mind to March of 2012 when I sat in this this congregation. And looking at all the things that God has done. But God's word says in Luke, Jesus says, To whom much is given, much is what? Required. And I don't say that to you unashamedly. We want you to feel the compelling call of God and the vision on your life. So this morning, we're going to get up to the launching pad. We're not going to launch it yet. We're going to get up to the launching pad and see what this is going to look like. And we're going to launch from the book of Acts. We looked at that in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. And in in 2015, we're going to just park ourselves in the book of Acts and work our way through and see what God was doing in the early church and what effect that has on us as Petal First Baptists. So we're setting a vision, a mark to hit, a goal to work towards, a challenge to rise to. And it is one that we believe is so far beyond us that it will require us to depend completely upon the Lord like never before. I want you to know this vision plan is impossible. Does that encourage you today? We're going to put a plan that's impossible before you. And we, want to, we feel like it's this way. It's like the Jordan River and, and, or it's the, the Exodus and they look behind them and there's Pharaoh and in front of them is the, is the Red Sea. What are they to do? Because we don't understand that this Christian life, we're called to work as if it all depends on us knowing in the end that it all depends on God. And what we know is this, the kind of churches where God moves as we've studied churches are those kind of churches that are on the edge. Those churches that are not just content to be the status quo, but are on the edge saying, God, if you don't help us do this, it won't happen. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of church I want to be a part of. Good, it's just me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I just want to make sure that was the case. We're praying for God to give us a fresh vision that our church can embrace. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, where there is no vision, the people will perish. We discovered from our transformational church assessment and other things we looked at to help us identify why do we need a vision plan anyway. One of the things we identified was is that you as a church family said, we really don't know what the vision of our church is. We're really not really sure where we're going. We're doing some good things and some good things are happening, but where are we going? So we wanted to put in front of you a vision, hence the Vision 2020 report. And that Vision 2020 is obviously to get us to the year 2020, but also that God would give us 2020 vision. Some of us in our in our Christianity are like me without glasses. Y'all become really, really fuzzy. I can't see you very well. You just kind of, y'all become one colored blob. I can see a few colors here and there. I have to have these. It gives me almost 20-20 vision, right? Now y'all look, wow, this is better this way. And, uh, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So um, we, we need 2020 vision. We need to see what is 2020 vision, Christian speaking wise. It is this, is we see the world the way God sees it. We see people the way that God sees it. We see people and have the heart that God has for our community. And so our prayer is over these next six weeks, and I beg you, plead you, double dog, dare you, whatever I can do, that you will not miss the next six Sundays. I know after that point, it's spring break, so some of us are going to go to the ends of the earth and, and, and relax and chill out or whatever some of us are going to do. But, but I want to encourage you, and I hope you're still here if you're in town those days, but these next six Sundays are crucial because I'm going to give you a big old flyover like a 787 is going to roar over this. You're going to feel like you're in one of those conferences you've gone to, and you sit for eight hours, and you feel like somebody just like gagged you with all the food because it's going to be so large. You can't understand it all. Don't expect you to. We just want you to get the fly over this morning. And then the next four Sundays, we're going to dive into each of these four parts of the vision team. And then Sunday, March the 1st, a crucial, critical day. You got to be here. That Sunday will be our, our generosity commitment Sunday. We'll bring those commitment cards we talked about last week back together. We'll bring those first generosity gifts that we committed that helps us understand what the vision is. And then that night, we're going to come that night and celebrate and eat Good old Southern Baptist style, enjoy it together and rejoice in what the commitments that have been made. And those, and we'll, we're going to officially vote to embrace the Vision 2020 plan. So these Sundays are crucial. So let's dive in this morning. What is it? You have your outline here. We have some PowerPoint as we go along, help you think about this. Here's our challenge. Here's the challenge, a renewed vision. This church has had a vision before. It's not like for the very first time we're going, oh, we've got a vision. This church has been on a mission. It's been a lot around. It'll be next year. I think it is, Gary, right next year. It'll be 70 years old. Petal First Baptist will be. Founded in 19. 19- 
46, right? Good, I'm, just, I'm on it. Uh, 70 years old, right? They've had a vision before. They've reached people. You can go back and look at the, the church history. I read some of it this week. Thinking about the hearts and minds of people who, who were charter members, who sacrificed, who gave. The first church budget was like 6,000 whopping dollars. I mean, it was like nothing. But they, they gave and they, they built a building and they worked together. Then you, you've had visions over the years, the vision culminating in this building we're sitting in back in 1999. And they had some ideas, but the vision somewhere got blurred and lost. And so we're bringing a renewed vision. And here it is. We desire. We're, we're asking you to make this your vision, all right? Here it is. We desire to be radically transformed by God into a people he can use to transform others. Would you say that with me? We desire to be radically transformed by God into a people he can use to transform others. We came back and grabbed our transform banner from our series we did back in the fall. Because we wanted that word to be a part of what we're doing. This word, transformation, is critical. Apologize, I'm going to have to do that a lot. I took some meat snacks this morning and my mouth is dry. Uh, transformation. We, we read through this book called Simple Church, which helped us think through some things, Essential Church. And then we came to this book called Transformational Church, which really, really turned us in a, in a, in a fresh direction to really help us think even more than what we were looking at. Did we understand the, the, the numbers are not always where, where it's most important. The baptism, the budgets, the buildings, the bodies. What we found was, is that churches that God was using and that God was growing were churches who keyed in on this one word, those that were seeing lives transformed. We want to see lives here that come and are impacted by the gospel because you give and you serve and they find Christ as Savior and Lord. But we don't want to just leave them there. We want to see them disciple and become those that impact their schools, their communities, their neighborhoods, their workplaces for the kingdom of God. And how does that happen? God has to radically transform us. God has to shake us up. God's got to get our attention. God's got to help us see the world the way he sees it. And ask us to become people that God can do transformational work through. That we can become the conduits. Now, can we transform anybody, church family? Can we save anybody? No, we can all say that together. No, absolutely not, right? We are called to be the conduit, the vehicle through which God moves and God uses us to offer a lost and dying world the hope and the message of Jesus Christ. That is the challenge, transformation. So we have a choice though. And we have a clear defining choice. We're gonna have to pray about it over the next five weeks. And here's the first step in the choice we can make on your outline. If you're following along, you can fill those out there. We have a choice, We're going to give you a choice. This is not something we're coming as a vision team and saying to you, you have to adopt it. Now, we're certainly praying and hoping and believing that you will. But we have three choices. Number one, we can go back to the way we were. I've met people throughout the years in churches, and they say statements like, and I've said them before too, man, I miss the good old days. You ever said that before? Well, I've said it lots of times in my life, and I'm just 43. I'm not... I'm not that old. I know some of y'all think I'm ancient, but I remember thinking 43 of how old that people were. We can go back to the way we were. We can go back to the way Petal First Baptist used to be. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing necessarily bad about that. But what we have to be reminded of is our culture is not back in those days any longer. Right? If I go back to when I grew up as a child, we went to church. I was at church I mean, hours on Sundays. When I was a teenager, I was at church on an average of six hours a day on Sunday. We went to meetings on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We went to Wednesday night for three hours. We had other times on the weekend. We were all the time. Life was different. But we can go back the way we were. And if we're not careful, we'll become insignificant and dead because our culture will pass us by. Second thing we can do, we can, this is not too bad, we can stay like we are. I don't know about you, but I like, I like to be comfortable. You like to be comfortable? Right? If we came in this morning, I should have done this just to illustrate it. We could bring in just some wood pews. No fluffy chairs. That's the back the way we used to do it. Some of y'all grew up on those hard benches, right? Oh, Lord, help us. I mean, that was some stiff benches, right? We sat up straight, though, that's for sure. You couldn't slouch very much on those. Right? We can some hard benches. I like things the way they are right now. I love what I can see. It's, I, I, well, I liked it like two years ago because I kind of knew almost everybody. And now I don't know half of you, it seems, sometimes. Maybe you feel the same way. But God's doing some great things. So let's just keep doing what we're doing. We're not, we're not doing bad things. We're doing some good things. But let's just stay where we are. Or the third option is, is we can boldly, 
move ahead into the future to what God is calling us to do that takes us far from just where we are, which is good and significant and important. Don't don't misunderstand me. But I believe and I hope that you believe that God is calling us to more, to be more, to do more, to impact our world. So how is that going to happen? We have to answer the call. There is a call that God has given to us. It involves this one word. It involves our DNA. It's going to require a DNA shift. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Outside of a building committee choosing colors of carpet and paint, outside of that part, this is much harder. To commit people to give to a building, it was hard to get people to relocate. That was difficult. But we're talking about DNA. And if you know anything about DNA, you have DNA inside of your body, right? And what we're asking God to do is something extraordinary that we really can't control. And that is asking God to change your DNA and mine. Asking God to change the DNA of our church. That will require us to think about church differently. That will require us to think about Christianity differently than we have in previous years. We're not talking about changing the message of the gospel, hear me. But how we go about doing it and the impact that we're called to have is significant. We're going to ask you to do four things. Number one, a call to connect deeply. A call to connect deeply. In our generation, in our culture today, it is very easy for people to join. Just say, hey, I'm going to join. I'm a member. I got my name on the roll. We talked about it last week. We got uh, 50% of our membership give 3% of the resources to our church, right? There's a lot of folks who haven't been inside the church building in years and years and years, but they're a member of our church. Guess what? They're not connected, much less connected deeply. But for those of you who are here, our prayer, our call, our vision is this, is that you would be connected deeply to the life of Petal First Baptist. That is a part of your DNA. It is a part of who you are. It is a part of what you talk about. It is a part of what you plan your life and your schedule around. It's you plan it around the church and being an active, vital part of it, that you are connected deeply, not at the surface, not just, listen to me carefully, not just walking into worship one hour a week and walking out the door and nobody knows you, nobody knows what's happening in your life, that you are not connected deeply, that's all that you do. We are calling you, we're pleading you, we're challenging you, get connected deeply. Secondly, a call to grow deeper. A call to grow deeper. There's always a temptation when we begin to grow rapidly. And we saw that in the first two years I was here, that growth has kind of leveled off to a 10 to 15% growth, a little bit more manageable. The first two years, like 50 and 75%, it was crazy. And what can happen sometimes is we grow a mile wide, but only an inch deep. And our call is, is we want to grow wide, don't we? What things, our influence is growing wide. We're touching more lives. But at the same time, that's happening. We must be growing deeper. Our roots must be going deeper as individuals, deeper in the Word of God, deeper in the disciplines of being a Christ follower, deeper in our connections, deeper growing to understand who God is and what God's call is on our lives. A call to grow deeper. Thirdly, a call to commit sacrificially. A call to commit sacrificially. Folks, we want to ask you unashamedly to commit to serving somewhere on on February the 22nd, I think it is, on that Sunday morning and then Sunday morning, March the 1st. We're going to transform this room. I don't know how we're going to fit all of y'all in here and the tables. We'll figure it out somehow. We'll switch the rows a little bit. We're going to have a, a connect area, a grow area, a commit area, and a go area. And we're going to ask every single person, every single person to sign up to be a part of a team. And to commit sacrificially to be part of those teams. What happens sometimes during this part of the year is folks begin to feel overwhelmed and we begin to bail out. Well, I can't do that anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. I can't. Folks, if God's going to use us to be the people he's calling us to be, we've got to commit sacrificially. We have to. And let me tell you what, here's the challenge of it. We think, oh, sacrificially, that sounds terrible and horrible. Oh, no, it is the greatest call of a Christ follower's life is to sacrifice. The problem is in Christianity, we've taken the word sacrifice out of the equation. Yet only do it if it's convenient, only if it's easy, only if I like it, if I feel good. No, no, it's called to sacrifice. It's a powerful call. The fourth and final thing is a call to multiply rapidly. A call to multiply rapidly. What do we mean by that? It means this, that we have in our DNA, inside the life of this church, that, for example, in life groups, we do not want your life group a year from now to look the same that it does now. Now, in other churches in in years prior, we got in our class and we're like, here I am, I'm in concrete and nobody's going to move me till I graduate to the cemetery. Right? I move all the way through and that's never God's call. We're going to study the book of Acts. What happened? There was the word multiplication. 
So our challenge to you is, for example, for life groups is, what are you doing in your life group to grow it in such a way, and I don't mean just the leader of the life group, I'm talking about you that are part of a life group, to help it grow in such a way that it can birth another one and another one and another one. And not only that, we want to take our DNA to be thinking, how can we birth new groups outside of these four walls? This summer, we're going to go to back door, Backyard Bible Clubs in downtown Petal. There's some groups already praying about it, about that very thing. We, we, we feel called to help plant churches in other areas in Jackson, Mississippi. So we're going to partner with Shekinah Glory. We're going to partner with a church in Toledo, Ohio to help them plant a church. We're going to go to the ends of the earth to help see a sustained church planting movement. You get it. Our DNA is called to multiply. Our problem is in most Southern Baptist churches and other churches too is we just simply do it by addition. We do it by addition. We had one, we had two, we had three, we had four. But what if, here's that what if again, what if our church took seriously the call to share the gospel? Every one of us took that call. And by the way, in March and into April, some of you said on the Transformational Church Assessment, I don't know how to share my faith and I haven't done so. Over 30% of our congregations said I have not shared my faith in the last six months, not one time. Folks, we're going to call you and equip you to do that very thing. What if that happened? What if it just depended upon the preacher or the leaders? What if it depended on you as the members? And we began to take that seriously. And every one of us took somebody. And I'll watch you in just a minute. I'm going to show you this transformation journey. It begins multiplication very quickly. Notice the change. The first part of the change is uh, the change logo. We're going to have a revised logo. Here's our current logo, which is really great and awesome. And we, we jumped on it when I first got here. But here's the new one. I want you to see this new one that Chris Robbins has done an incredible job of helping flesh out what we've talked about in our vision teams. There's the new logo. It's on the front of your bulletin this morning. We printed it in color so you could see it. And here it is. It's similar to what we already have, but it adds some new components to it. Now, I want you to notice some things. Go to the next one, if you will, I think, Michael. Yeah. These four words. We want you to notice this, this logo means something significant. It's not just something pretty because we couldn't think of it was better to do. It is significant. When you see this logo, I want you to notice, first of all, the cross. On the logo, now you go flip back if you will, Michael. On the logo, you notice the cross is around now where our part of our logo is what? What's in the background? Just so I know that you can see it. The world, right? Do you see that? Thank you, Matthew. The world, right? Right there, there's the world behind us, right? We see it, right? But what is this? The cross. It's Christ's arms wrapped around the world. That is our call, too, to follow Christ and to wrap our arms around the world from the ends of the earth to Petal, Mississippi, to the back doors of Petal, Mississippi. That's our call. That cross has significance. So put wrap its arm around the world. Notice the second piece. Then the second piece is the world. Obviously, you get that. It's the world. We want us to think about it and have our minds on the world. The, on the ends of the earth, we want to have your mind on the Sangal Sakadal. So one of the things we want to see happen over this wall right over here is to put Petal Mississippi missions that are happening so you can see it and pray for it. Mississippi mission, Shekinah Glory. We want to have Brother Carl here, another Brother Carl, different one from Mount Vernon, and, uh, and have some stuff there. The next wall, Toledo, Ohio, some pictures you can see. Sangal Sakadal, you can see what's happening. We're sending a group here in about four weeks going to the Sangal Sakadal. We want you to see what's happening, that we have a heart for the world. Thirdly, our church name. I want you to notice this. This is pretty cool. I'm not sure we planned it this way, but it worked out really cool. Notice that we're not, the Petal First Baptist is not outside of the world. What did Jesus say? Vision team, this is really good. God just gave me this this week. You ready for this? Jesus said, I've not called you to be out of the world, but to be what? In the world. Sometimes this culture makes us just want to hide our heads in the sand and hide our kids and just hope to God they can survive. Don't you feel that way? Sometimes our culture is just so sick. And yet Jesus is called, his disciples then is the same as the call now, is that we're called to be in the world. So where are we, Petal First Baptist? It's inside the world to impact it. Man, I get excited about that. All right, here's the last thing, the shape. Notice the shape part here, right? It's got a rotation to it. It's, 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 it's a shape for a reason. We'll talk about that in just a second. Now, notice the next part, the core convictions. And you're going to have to read these later because there is no way I'm even going to get close to finishing. So there are the core convictions. You have to come back and look at them. Intense relationships. You can see those there. Transformed lives and missional living. Those are our three core values we're going to value. We'll come back and unpack these later. Powerful, important words. Notice the chart. Another C word here. The chart, a transformation journey. Here's what you want you to see. A lot of you identified this. I don't know what it means or looks like to be a committed follower of Christ. What does a disciple look like? So we want you to see these colors have significant points here, all right? And it starts over here at the connect part, right? We want you to connect yourself and others to Christ and the church. So that's the first step. You become part of the church. You take the starting point, class 101. You sign a church covenant. I'm committed to being a part of Petal First Baptist. I am connected. Not just my name on the roll, but I'm connected. 
Secondly, you go to the next step. Are you growing in a deep relationship with Christ? Are you growing in, connected to a life group and growing in that life group? Are you growing individually in your walk with the Lord? Are you growing in a smaller group even than that with three or four men or three or four ladies once a month getting around a table, looking at each other in the face saying, how you doing? Oh, how's your walk with the Lord? Who are you sharing Christ with? What can I pray with you about? And we get past praying for my aunts, uncles, cousins, big dog who has an infection. All right? It goes far beyond that versus this. How's your thought life? How's your marriage? How's your relationship with your kids? Oh, it's going to get real quiet right here. Oh, oh, preacher, now, I'm good, but I I ain't going that deep. That ain't nobody's business but mine. Hello. Sound like anybody you know? Sounds like me. (laughs) We're called to be connected deeply to each other. No, we don't go into a group of 100 people and and share all these things. We do it in a small group, a private group, where we hold each other accountable. We grow together. Third, we commit. We're working around the clock here. We commit. Commit to your time and resources to serving Christ and others in a ministry here. Lastly, you go. You go to share the love of Christ with everyone everywhere. Here's the goal. The question we'll ask you, where are you on this chart? Are you connected? Are you growing? Are you committed to serve? And are you going? Now, there are some of you, bless God, you've already gone past, you're already in these four, you're going, what is my step? I've already gone around here, I'm already going to Haiti or somewhere else. Well, here's my question to you, and here's a zinger, here's a zinger. It's a zinger to me too, so don't think it's just for you. Who in your life are you sharing the gospel with, and you're going to help them get connected? You're going to help them grow and understand what it means to be a Christ follower. Who are you helping get connected and committed to a service and helping them to go? Because that's when multiplication happens. So if I grab David Merrill, and I share Christ with David Merrill, and I help David go around this trend, transformational journey, this map, if you will, this picture of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And I take David, and I take David all the way around, and I say it to go part, hey, David, I love you, man. Good luck. Now it's your turn. Go find somebody. Now he might be finding somebody even before we get to this point. That would be even better. And so what does David do? Then David begins to pour in his life, and I leave David alone, and I go find somebody else. So now instead of just two of us, instead of just a preacher trying to share Jesus with everybody, now there's two of us. You follow me? Watch this. Don't miss this. This is multiplication. This is good math. All my math teachers will be so proud of me. You ready for this? Okay. So then David grabs my, I grabs my. Now, now me, they find Christ. My person finds Christ. So David, you share with uh, Austin and I share with uh, Jake. And, and, and so I, now we got each other. Okay. So we share with each other, right? And so then you do the same thing, David. You work him around the path. I work Jake around the path. He gets it. He goes and finds somebody else. Now instead of four people, there are eight people. And after that eight people, then it goes to 16 and 16 to 32, right? And so you can see very quickly that we baptized 30-something people the last two years, each last two years almost. What more can we do? We can multiply rapidly. Why multiply rapidly? Well, because we want to be featured in a magazine and host a conference and write a book and talk about how great our preacher is. That's what we want to do. People ask me from time to time, preacher, what are y'all doing over there? <laughs> I have no idea. God, God's doing some amazing things. It's pretty cool. We're going to put them in some packages, though, to kind of be able to help us understand why God is doing what he's doing and funnel that and channel that into an even more laser-like focus. This is how we're doing it. Folks, here's why we're doing it. Don't miss this. 70% of this city is dying and going to hell. The question is, do we care? That's the question. I don't mean, do do I say do I care? Does it show by what I do and how I live? So what is the criteria? And I'm going to have to fly through these two. These kind of lay out where our programs fit under these key words, the connect, grow, commit, go. Under the connect part, yourself and Christ to others, our worship services, first Super Sunday nights, family supper, special events, those fit under here. Teams, we're going to form under those. Keep flying through, through there, if you will. Uh, um, no, no, there should be one in between there. Did I not have one in between there? I may have lost it. Um, underneath there, let me see if I've got it. Obviously, I don't have it. Do I? Michael, it would be right there. <clears throat> I printed this just in case. It's not there either. Praise the Lord. All right. Underneath there are some teams. Oh, it comes down later. Never mind. Just kidding. All right. Go to the next one. I got too much on my brain. Good night. If you could ever climb inside my brain, it is a scary place. All right. Notice the second piece. Go back to grow, if you will. Um, grow in a deep relationship with Christ. Fellowship and discipleship. These are purposes of the church that we're making sure we cover. Refuel on Wednesday nights. Life group. Age group ministries. All right. And our class 201. Go to the next one. We got a five here. Commit your time and resource to Christ and others. Ministry teams, hospitality, fathers, children, family, supper teams, food pantry, greeters, or all the ministry teams. Even you could put the age group here serving in the ministry team somewhere. 
All right, class 301. The criteria, share the love of Christ with everyone everywhere, evangelism. These four groups that we share Christ with in these areas and these missions are what come under that. All right, that's the criteria. Look for the next one here. Here's, here, here's where some of the big pieces we've laid out for you, just quickly. We want to see a 75% overall average attendance of our membership, of our membership, which is resident members, over 500. There's 650 members, but residents over about 515 or so. Right now, we're averaging about 58%. We want to see a 10% growth in that. So that means every year for the next couple of years, we're going to see a 3 to 4% growth in that. We are praying about, this is not in concrete, so nobody panic, all right? We're praying about by 2017. That we'll be in two worship services. Oh no. I won't be in the same room with everybody. People tell me that. I'm like, well, do you know everybody in the room right now? Anybody be able to stand up and identify every person in the room? Anybody? Who's bold? No. Okay, that means I gotta preach twice. Okay, I'm not happy either. Well, actually, I am. I'd love to preach twice. That would be fantastic. I'm lying. Right? Why don't we do that? Look, look around this room, folks. How many we got in the building, Jake? Just want to give you an example. 305. Okay? Here, this work, wonderful. We, we have set up about, we're way over the 80% mark right now. Okay? Statistically tell us all the research we've done, you get over 80%, people are full, and they go, there's not a seat for me. Now, we have an awesome prime front row that is completely empty right here. Everywhere else in this front row, too. Otherwise than that, we're, we're, we're full up. Folks, we get to about 400 people in this room, it's going to be crowded, really crowded. So we've got to make room for more people. You would have been the one thing about second worship service. A clearly defined process from taking a guest from the parking lot all the way to membership, being deeply connected. An atmosphere of prayerful dependence, spontaneous prayer. We have become a praying church, a praying people, and a full-time worship leader by 2020. Next, these teams. These teams, we're going to ask you to sign up for one of these kind of teams if you want to be on the Connect team. Creative worship teams, technical teams, greeter teams, uh, front door team. There's a middle team that's going to have. We're going to have build, hopefully, some connection stations, if we could call them that, where people come and find information about our church. We walk them to life groups, walk them to the, to the preschool and children's hall. If they come in here, we connect people, follow up middle back door. We have people that their job is and their calling is to make sure people stay connected. We don't have a back door pedal first Baptist. We're going to slam that puppy shut. And you come and join, you ain't going out the back door. Unless God calls you to move, and even then we're going to pray against it. Like the Fairchilds, we're just praying against it. God won't move you. We like you when you get here. We don't want you to go anywhere, right? We want you to stay. We want you to get disconnected. A starting point team. Go to the next one. Are y'all feeling overwhelmed yet? I'm tired. All right, here we go. Grow. Life groups. We're at 72% of those who come to worship. 72% of you are in a life group, which is pretty good. But we want to be at the 75 to 80% mark. Growing churches that are like really growing, 75 to 85%. So we're not far from that. That means we run in 383 in life groups. All right, let me just give you this picture. I'm guessing today we had about 230 in life groups. We've got about one or two more spaces. We're trying to get some space completed upstairs to give us a few more rooms. But we get by 2020, we're going to be way, way, way out of space. So that means we've got to do one of three things. We're going to have to take groups off campus. We're going to have to start a second life group hour. Oh, age group folks will love that. Or we complete space. And God gives us somebody who has $2 million to pay off the debt and another million to finish upstairs, and we're good to go. I'm convinced that person's out here is just looking to find $2 million, what to do with it. All right? We got to reproduce leaders. Go, go back. Right, right. We got to reproduce leaders. We got to have a plan in place. We want leadership to happen. In order for that to happen, we got to have more life group leaders, more folks that are trained. We want to train you. One of the things we learned from Transformational Church Assessment was that y'all didn't feel like we, and we aren't, we don't really train you well on how to do leadership. We're trying to do a better job. We got to do even more. 10 to 20 new life groups. 10 to 20. We're talking about over doubling the number of life groups in the next five years. Develop curriculum, discipleship staff, a children preschool person, accountability groups. Keep going. Whoo, all these age group teams you can join. Keep going. I'm going to put all this on the website tomorrow, okay? Uh, helping people find their shape um, and where they can serve. We want me to know. We want you to say, oh, well, okay, I feel guilty. I'll serve in the preschool. Praise God. Huh. Hey, I don't feel that guilty. I am not called, shaped in any way, shape, form, or fashion to work in the preschool, nor the children's ministry. Except from up here during Kids Extreme, when I'm up here and y'all are down there. I'm good, right up here, right? I don't feel called the same way I'm shaped. Right? Some of you, you love children's ministry. The thought of speaking in front of an adult makes you want to die. But speaking in front of kids, no problem. That's my wife. She doesn't want to teach adults. She'll be glad to teach kids. Some of you are thinking, I don't run those kids. Ugh, I'll be glad to speak to adults, right? Help me find their shape. God shaped you uniquely to serve in one of these four areas. Equipping new leaders. Increase 20%. Woo! Check this baby out. Increasing our giving by 20%. So the 20% are only giving 40%. I think that's what that number means, Chris. Is that right? I think that's maybe what that means. I can't remember. Generosity ladder. Everybody taking the next step, right? Okay? Let's go to the next one. All these themes you can jump on. Next one. 
Every member doing involved in hands-on missions once a year. Oh, that, that, that gets, the thought of that just sends me over the edge. That every person by the time calendar year 2015 over will be able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, I gave at least one day of my life to serve somebody else. Yes. That's 305 of you. Minus 20 of you who aren't members yet. Y'all can laugh at that. That was funny. That was good. I like that. A church planning mindset. Watch this. We're praying that God will get us to a place in our church ministry plan that 50% of what comes in these doors and given in these baskets go right back outside these doors. Currently, right now, we're about, roughly about 10%. That is a massive increase. We believe that's what God wants us to do. Missional living, missions pastor, other teams you can join. Go to the next one. What's the next one? Is it the picture? No, the resource team, I think it is. I don't have time to do this either. Time's up. Resource team. We're gonna do, the fifth part of this component is here is resource. Personnel, finance, building a grounds fits under this. A leadership core team that meets with the pastor and staff. And then a le- new church leadership team that takes a leader from each of these four areas plus our age group ministries that help us navigate and begin to implement this vision 2020. So what is it for you? Here it is. Very quickly. Another, another step ladders, right? We want you to take the next step to connect. Where are you connected right now? Where do you need to connect deeper in your own walk with the Lord? Who do you need to help connect? Secondly, where are you growing? Are you growing in your walk with the Lord? Are you closer to the Lord this year than you were last year, last month and this month? Are you committed to serve? Are you committed to be a part of this church family, not just on the edge, but really truly deeply committed? Are you willing to go to the ends of the earth? Or for some of us, the ends of the earth would be easier than going to our own neighbor or family member or friend. And lastly, resources. We'll begin to think about how we do our resources together. Taking the next step. Yeah, we want you to take your next step in giving. We talked about that last week. We want you to take the next step as well. And this is to us is just as significant as what you give. So the giving ties into the vision. What if God would call us to do these things? There was an incredible picture, and I close with this. It was taken. It was a Pulitzer Prize winning photo. I'm not a photographer, but I've met photographers. And to take a picture that got the Pulitzer Prize, there's only one of those. It's a big deal. Back in 1993, a photographer by the name of Kevin Carter took a picture that landed on the front of Time magazine in 1993. It was a picture taken in the country of Sudan. What's significant about this picture is it is a picture that's not one to celebrate. It is a horrible picture to look at, but I'm going to let you see it in just a moment. It would epitomize the famine that was ravaging Sudan. And by the way, Sudan, for many of us, it gave Operation Christmas Child shoeboxes. This is pretty significant to me. Went to the country of Sudan where this picture was taken. In 1993, Carter headed into the north border town with somebody named Silva to photograph the rebel movement. He made, began to take the pictures. As he began to take the pictures, he heard a soft, high-pitched whimpering and saw a tiny girl trying to make her way to the feeding center. Here's the picture that he took. Take the lights down if you will so we can really see it good. This is a little girl. He sat there for about 20 minutes, not moving, hoping, he says in his own words, the vulture would spread its wings to capture the picture. He stood there for 20 minutes as the girl was trying to make her way to the feeding station. 20 minutes. He snapped the picture. He left. He ran the bird off, got back in his vehicle, and left. In his words, he said, after I sat down under a tree, I lit a cigarette, talked to God, and cried. He kept saying he wanted to hug his daughter. He returned to Johannesburg, and coincidentally, the New York Times got a hold of the picture and ran it on March 26, 1993. He became famous. His self-confidence began to climb. He thought it was really somebody. But then along the way, somebody began to say that the, the picture was a fluke, alleging he had set it up. And then somebody even suggested what happened to the girl. Why didn't you help the girl? Two months later, in 1994, after he received his Pulitzer Prize for taking this picture, in Johannesburg, South Africa, at the age of 33, just two months after receiving the Pulitzer Prize, he stuck a hose in his vehicle and died of carbon monoxide poisoning. 
And in this note, he said, I'm really, really sorry. The pain of life overrides the joy to the point that joy does not exist. Dear friends, I want you to show this photo and I hope it makes you uncomfortable because it makes me uncomfortable. And I want to go back to those statements that we just mentioned at the very beginning as a church. We can go back, no, no, just stay where you are, stay where you are. We can go back to the way we were. We can close our eyes and stay the way we are. Or we can do something about it and not just chase the bird away, but pick up this little girl and carry her to the feeding station and help her find the spiritual food she needs to find Jesus. My question to you is, what will you do? And what will Petal First Baptist do? And what will be said about us in the history books 50 years from now? Did we embrace the call for the sake of the call? Would you pray with me for just a moment?